Hello and welcome. Let's start off by talking cardiovascular system today. When we talk cardiovascular system, cardiovascular system is going to be made up of a few components, and the few components it'll be made up of will include, number one, the heart. So cardiovascular system we'll see is made up of a few components. Number one, we have the heart. Number two, we'll go through, we'll check out blood vessels. And then number three, we'll have blood, and we'll check blood out there as well. So here when we go through and we talk cardiovascular system, first we'll check out the heart. And um, here when we go through and we check out the heart, uh, uh, we'll kind of uh, check everything out here at once, and then we'll jump into just the heart and check out the heart by itself. So here when we go through and we talk about the heart, the heart is basically, I want you to think of uh, this whole transport system's pump. The heart is the transport system's pump. Here was a heart is transport system. Uh, it's one part of the transport system. Uh, so two uh, side by side pumps. Yeah, exactly. So the heart is this transport system's pump. And now when you think of the heart, I want you to think of the heart as two pumps found side by side. The right side of the heart, its own individual pump. The left side of the heart then being its own individual pump. Okay, so the heart is two pumps that are going to be found side by side. The right side of the heart, I'd like you to know, receives oxygen-poor blood. The right side of the heart will receive oxygen-poor blood. And it will receive oxygen-poor blood from body tissues. And it will receive this blood from body tissues. And then it will pump this blood to the lungs. It will pump this blood to the lungs. So that way now... Here at the lungs, we can pick up oxygen and we can dispose of carbon dioxide. So again, the right side of the heart receives oxygen-poor blood from the body's tissues. And then it pumps this blood to the lungs. It'll pump this blood to the lungs so that way this blood can pick up oxygen and it can dispose of its carbon dioxide, its CO2. Now the blood vessels, okay, the blood vessels that are responsible for carrying this blood to and from the lungs. So the blood vessels that are responsible for routing this blood to and from the lungs are going to be known as your pulmonary circuit. So when we talk pulmonary circuit, your pulmonary circuit is made up of blood vessels. And these blood vessels are going to be responsible for routing blood to and from the lungs. To and from the lungs. Again, your pulmonary circuit is what we have there. Next, then we have the left side. The left side of the heart, it receives now the oxygenated blood. So it will receive oxygenated blood or oxygen-rich blood, and it will receive this oxygen-rich blood from the lungs, and it will pump this blood throughout the body. It will pump this blood then throughout the body to help supply oxygen, and to help supply nutrients to our body's tissues, to our body's tissues. Now here we're going to give these blood vessels a special name as well. Now the blood vessels you'll see that are going to be responsible for carrying blood to and from all body tissues are going to be known as our systemic circuit. So we took care of the pulmonary circuit there, and now we have our systemic circuit. So let's actually visually see these, let's visualize them, right in here. So here you can see blood vessels that are going to be routing blood to and from the lungs, pulmonary circuit we said, routing blood now to and from our body tissues, systemic circuit we described there. So you can appreciate then basically both circuits there very nicely. So you've got your pulmonary circuit and then your systemic circuit. Now when we go through and we talk about the heart, you'll see the heart, it's going to be basically receiving this blood now, right side and left side we talked about there. Now right side, the receiving chambers and left side receiving chambers are going to be the atria. Now the atria, you can see, <clears throat> excuse me, on the right side are going to receive blood, we said, from this systemic circuit. 
Now, when we go through and we talk about the left atria, the left atria is going to receive oxygen-rich blood. So here, oxygen-poor blood, left atria is going to receive oxygen-rich blood. That's returning from the pulmonary circuit. More specifically speaking, the left atria is going to receive this oxygen-rich blood that's coming from the lungs. Right atria is receiving oxygen-rich blood that's returning from the body's tissues. From the body's tissues. Now, the pumping chambers of the heart are going to include the ventricles. So the receiving chambers versus the pumping chambers. Now, the pumping chambers are responsible for pumping this blood out of the heart. Now, when we talk about the right side, the right side you have the right ventricle. Now, the right ventricle is going to pump this blood through one part of that pulmonary circuit. The left ventricle is going to be responsible for pumping this blood through one part of the systemic circuit. So now right ventricle, it'll pump this blood that it will receive from the right atria. It'll pump this blood now. It'll go from the right atria to the right ventricle. And then you, if you recall from anatomy, you've got the pulmonary trunk, which then gets subdivided into the pulmonary arteries, which then routes it to the lungs. Now when we talk our, when we talk uh, left ventricle, now the left ventricle is going to be routing this blood that it receives from the left atria into the aorta, and then the aorta will pass this blood forward. So again, you can see that all in way greater detail now. Right atria to the right ventricle to the lungs. Back from the lungs via the pulmonary veins into the left atria, pumped into the left ventricle from the left ventricle, then we said the aorta, and then distributing throughout the body. Now, when we go through and we talk about the heart, let's talk the heart in a little bit greater detail. When we talk about the heart, the heart, I would like you to know that the heart is going to be described as being about the size of our fist. It's approximately the size of our fist. You will get to see, uh, well, no, you won't get to see, um, uh, for sure you guys won't, we won't be back in school, uh, the cadaver uh, heart there as well, you have seen already from uh, previous semesters, and you've been able to appreciate that heart there as well. And you've seen sometimes we have some enlarged hearts there, and so you were able to appreciate cardiomegaly, I'm sure, if you took uh, uh, anatomy in the recent semesters where we had a couple of cadavers uh, that have depicted uh, cardiomegaly. So normally speaking about the size of your fist, <clears throat> and when we go through, we talk about the heart. The heart is described as a hollow. It's described as a hollow, cone-shaped, hollow, cone-shaped structure that has a mass, that has a mass of about 250 to 350 grams, a little less than a pound. excuse me, <clears throat> less than a pound. Now the heart, the heart you'll see is going to be located within the mediastinum. It's located within the mediastinum. If you recall, the mediastinum is going to be the medial cavity of the thorax, right? The ventral body cavity gets further subdivided into the thoracic cavity and then the abdominal pelvic cavity. Now the thoracic cavity gets further subdivided into the pleural cavities of the mediastinum. So the mediastinum is going to be the medial cavity of the thorax. Now the heart, when we talk about the heart, the heart extends from the second rib to the fifth intercostal space. The heart is going to be found located within the mediastinum, extending from the second rib down to the fifth intercostal space. The heart, it rests, you'll see the heart, it rests on the superior surface of the diaphragm. It rests on the superior surface of the diaphragm. Now when we go through and we talk, here we're able to see, so we can see the heart's going to be found running from the second rib down to the fifth intercostal space. 
Now here when we go through and we talk about the heart, we're, we're saying it rests on top of the superior surface of the diaphragm. So it rests on top of the superior surface of the diaphragm. And it's going to be found lying anterior to the vertebral column. It's found lying anterior to the vertebral column. And posterior to the sternum. And posterior to the sternum. Now when we go through and we talk about the heart, you'll see the heart itself now, we said is described as being about the size of your fist. So here we can appreciate now that heart being about the size of our fist, running from the second rib down to the fifth intercostal space. And you can see that there very nicely resting on top of the diaphragm, the muscle that helps to separate the two cavities from one another. And then it's within that mediastinum. And here you can see the heart in relation to the mediastinal line. Now I'd like you to know the heart has a base to it. The base is found on the posterior surface. The base is going to lean towards the right shoulder. It leans towards the right shoulder. And the heart also has a apex to it. It also has an apex to it. Now the apex you'll see is going to be pointed towards the left hip. So here let's say this is the apex of the heart. Um, I can't see myself so I don't know if I'm even centered. I, I think you could see me. And so here is the heart and we've got the heart basically seated here and here just like this, right on top of the diaphragm. So here you can see how the apex is going to be pointed towards that hip, that left hip. And the base is going to be here, the base is going to be back here, the base is leaning towards that right shoulder. So now in relation to the apex, we have what we call the apical impulse. The apical impulse is going to be palpated, right? You'll see at that apex. So it's going to be palpated in between the fifth and the sixth ribs. So it'll be palpated at that fifth intercostal space. You can see it tells us just below the, nef the left nipple. So just below the left nipple. And again, you can see that here very nicely. So we'd have the nipple probably about right in this area here, let's say. So here you can see at that fifth intercostal space. Again, you can feel that in yourself, right? We can take uh, from anatomy, you learned uh, your landmarks, right? We've got the angle of Louis marking that second rib, and you can feel third, fourth, fifth, and you can come down here and feel then that point of maximal intensity right underneath the nipple. This is what we would do in lab there as well. You would take this pulse here uh, on yourself Along with that, you would take other pulses there as well that you're uh, welcome to do at home and make sure you can uh, kind of feel those there as well. Now, when we go through and we talk about the heart, now the heart, you can see its uh, location in relation to, we said, the sternum and then the vertebral column. And then here you can see in relation to the lungs there as well. Same thing here with the serous membrane removed. You can appreciate that very nicely. Now when we move into the heart, when we move into the heart, I'd like you to know that the heart is going to be divided up into four chambers and we've discussed the two uh, main chambers, uh, basically the four chambers there already. So here we can see a nice view of the outside of the heart and then here we can appreciate the inside of the heart. So here first when we talk about the outside, when we talk about the outside we can see a few components here we're going to go through, we're going to talk about first you can see superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, and they're both responsible for bringing blood into this right atrium. From the right atrium the blood will go into the right ventricle and then up into the pulmonary trunk and then to the lungs as we described. And then comes back into that left atrium now via the pulmonary veins into the left ventricle and then up into the aorta and then it'll get distributed throughout the body. So looking at all that here with it opened up you can see superior inferior vena cava routing blood into the right atrium, right ventricle and then into the pulmonary trunk and then to the lungs. Coming back from the lungs, left atria, left ventricle and then up into the aorta. So the four chambers you can see here the two superiorly located chambers are the atria. The two inferiorly located chambers are the ventricles, the ventricles. Now when we go through and we talk uh, inside of the heart, we can see here you've got now a structure separating the two atria and also separating the two ventricles. That's the septa. 
Here you can't appreciate that interatrial septum, but you can see that right inside of here. And here you've got that interventricular septum you can appreciate here. Now in relation to the interatrial septum, we've got the fossa ovalis, right? The fossa ovalis is a remnant of the foramen ovale, the foramen ovale of the fetal heart, correct? I don't know if you guys cover that in anatomy, um, but in my class we cover that. And uh, we go through that and we talk about how that foramen ovale was uh, there once it existed and it allows blood to make its way, it's oxygen-rich blood that's coming from mom, to make its way over into the left side so that way it could get distributed throughout the body. Now, here you can appreciate, again, that structure very nicely, fossa ovalis, right inside of there. So that's what allows in fetal circulation, because in fetal circulation, the baby's lungs, the fetus's lungs, they are not expanded. Those lungs don't expand until we make our way out and we... Uh, pressure changes and we take our first breath. So until then, what happens is that oxygen-rich blood is going to be coming in from mom, and if it comes in here, right, it's going to just go and get distributed and basically goes nowhere. So here what happens is it passes through and it makes its way into then the left side, and the left side then it could be distributed throughout the body, and that's how then this fetus's organs and tissues are receiving that oxygen-rich blood. And then once we're born, we take our first breath, Right, pressure changes occur. We take our first breath. We increase the resistance on the left side compared to the right side, and then that pressure increases on this side, snapping that foramen ovale shut, and then basically giving us the circulation that you see there now. It's quite fascinating. Quite fascinating. Next in here, we can see there's valves in here. There are valves in here, right? These valves now, they're going to do what any other valves do. They're going to regulate flow. They will regulate the passage of flow. Now the flow here is blood. So they'll regulate the flow of blood and they're going to prevent backflow is what we're trying to do. So what these valves are going to do is they're going to prevent the backflow of blood. Now, more specifically speaking, you can see here if we were talking backflow, now here you can say the, they're there to prevent the backflow of blood into the atria when the ventricles are contracting. Okay, so that's what those two valves there are for. And then preventing the backflow from the pulmonary trunk, you can see there in the aorta, pulmonary trunk and the aorta back into the ventricles once the ventricles have contracted. So there to help prevent the backflow of blood. Now each valve, we have four different valves there. Okay, so we're going to divide them up into two categories, basically two atrioventricular valves and then two semilunar valves. We'll go through and we'll look at basically the structure of each of these valves. So here when we go through, we talk about the AV valves. Each AV valve, right, atrioventricular, not apple valley, atrioventricular because it's in between the atria and the ventricles. Now when we go through, we talk about these atrioventricular valves. Each atrioventricular valve, as you've learned in anatomy, is going to have chordae tendinate to them. They will have what we refer to as chordae Tendine, chordae tendine. Very good. These chordae tendine will help anchor. They will help anchor the cusps of the valve. They will help anchor the cusps of the valves down to the papillary muscles. So here you can see the right AV valve. In this right AV valve, we've got all these chordae tendine. These chordae tendine now are, as we described, helping to connect these valve cusps, the flaps basically of the valves, down to this papillary muscle. So they're like the middleman in between them. Same thing you can see right inside of here. Chordae tendine, papillary muscle down here, and here you can see you've got the valve. So each AV valve has chordae tendine, which are going to help anchor the cusps to the papillary muscle. Now the first valve you can see here is the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve is also known as the right AV valve. The right AV valve. Now the mitral valve or the left AV valve, the mitral valve, the left AV valve, you can appreciate right inside of here. You can see they're saying bicuspid valve. Now bicuspid, we're going to probably be moving away from, uh, I read an article not too long ago about uh, how uh, they believe it's not bicuspid. It's uh, a little bit more than two cusps that are involved there. So mitral valve or left 
AV valve just to stay safe. And then the tricuspid and uh, right AV valve we've got on the other side. Next then we have our semi-lunar valves. We have our semi-lunar valves. Now when we talk about our semi-lunar valves, the semi-lunar valves are going to be found guarding, they are going to be found guarding the bases of each of our large arteries. They are going to be found guarding the bases of each of our large arteries. And the two large arteries will include the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So again, found guarding the base of each large artery. And you can see that there very nicely. And what they're going to do is they're going to prevent the backflow of blood. They will prevent the backflow of blood into the ventricles. The AV valves prevented the backflow into the atria. So here they're going to prevent the backflow of blood into the ventricles. Now like the AV valves, the semilunar valves, they open and close. So I want you to know all of these valves are going to open and they are all going to close in response to pressure changes. In response to pressure changes. In response to differences in pressure. Now the semilunar valves, I want you to know the semilunar valves will open. They will open when the ventricles are contracting. They will open when the ventricles are contracting. So semilunar valves open when the ventricles are contracting and the interventricular pressure and the interventricular pressure rises above the pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So these semilunar valves will open when the ventricles are contracting and the interventricular pressure rises above the pressure in the aorta and the pulmonary trunk. So the semilunar valves will open. Okay? They'll open when the ventricles are contracting and the interventricular pressure. So the pressure within the ventricles rises above the pressure on the opposite side. Same thing here. The pressure in here rises above the pressure on the other side. The aorta. No, when the ventricles relax, when the ventricles relax and the blood flows backwards, so when the ventricles relax and the blood then starts to flow backwards, same thing on this side, it starts to flow backwards. Right, this is the aorta I'm showing you there. And here you can see in the pulmonary trunk, when the blood starts to flow backwards, what's it going to do? It's going to start to fill those cusps with blood. So here, let's draw that in. So blood is moving forward. Now when the ventricles start to relax, and blood now starts to flow backwards, right, because of gravity. We had the pumping action, pushed as much as we could forward, and a little bit is going to start to trickle back. Now when that blood starts to flow backwards, it's going to start to fill in these cusps. When it starts to fill here in these cusps, it will cause these valves to close. It will cause those valves to close. The aortic valve, you can see right back there, is found at the base of the aorta. Now when we talk pulmonary valve, pulmonary valve is going to be found at the pulmonary trunk's base, at the base of the pulmonary trunk. So these are semilunar valves. You can look at their structure. It's different from the atrial ventricular valves. Again, something you should have uh, seen already there in anatomy, I'm sure.
So here we can see all the different vowels, as we've mentioned in there. So here we can appreciate the semilunar vowels. Here you can see now when blood comes in, we saw trickling back, causing them to then close. Now we have the aortic valve, we said, and then we have the pulmon uh, pulmonic or pulmonary valve, semilunar valves, each found at the base of the large trunks. Now here we can see the AV valves we've discussed there. Okay, now AV valves, you can see when you look at their structure, now they'll basically open up and when blood flows through. Now, same thing we're going to have here. Now, when blood flows through, and what's going to happen then as blood starts to fill into the ventricles, now here what will happen is when blood fills into the ventricles, this blood is going to push up against these valves. When it pushes up against these valves, it'll cause those valves to snap shut, as we're seeing right in this picture here. So here, blood comes into this chamber, fills into that chamber, and pushes up against, you can see that valve. When it pushes up against the valve, it causes that valve then to close. So they are going to open and they're going to close in response to pressure changes. So when the pressure is higher in the atria, it'll cause this valve to open. When the pressure is higher here in the ventricle, it'll cause this valve to close. When the pressure is higher in the ventricle compared to here, it'll cause that valve to open. When the pressure is higher on this side compared to this side, this side, it'll cause the valve to close. Same thing here, pressure is higher on this side versus this side, it'll cause the valve to open. Pressure is higher on this side compared to this side, it'll cause that valve to open, but again, if the pressure is higher on this side compared to this side, it'll cause it to close. So all pressure changes, all pressure changes, we're gonna go through, we're gonna check out, and we're gonna see. And the two semilunar valves we've got there as well. And same thing here, Blood flowing through will cause them to open up, and then when blood trickles back down, you can see it starts to sit right on top of those valves, causing them to then snap shut. All four valves you can appreciate here. Same thing we can see here. Now let's move down to the microscopic anatomy of our cardiac muscle cells. So we'll look at our cardiac muscle cells now in greater detail. So here when we go through and we talk about our cardiac muscle cells, we've gone through, we've talked about our cardiac muscle cells in uh, uh, minute detail in the past uh, when we've looked at muscles. So here we'll see cardiac muscles, uh, cardiac muscle cells are going to be striated as we've described. They are striated. They're very short, branched, fat, interconnected, cells. They will have one central nuclei, perhaps two, but most commonly we'll see one. So they're striated like skeletal muscle. I want you to know cardiac muscle cells will contract by the sliding filament mechanism. Striated like skeletal muscle, Cardiac muscle is, and cardiac muscle contracts. It contracts by the sliding filament mechanism. Cardiac muscle cells contain, like I said, one or more, two at the most, nuclei, and these cells themselves are going to be short, fat, branching, interconnected cells. The cell's volume is mostly made up of myofibrils. The cell's volume is going to be mostly made up of myofibrils that are composed of typical sarcomeres, as we've described when we looked at skeletal muscle. The sarcomeres have Z discs, they have A bands, I bands, myosin, and actin.
Here we can see, when we talk about cardiac muscle, cardiac muscle also has connective tissue. The connective tissue matrix, the endomyceum, connects to the cardiac skeleton. And now here we're going to see T-tubules here as well. The T-tubules are going to be wide and less numerous compared to skeletal muscle. The sarcoplasmic reticulum is much more simpler than in skeletal muscle. And we've got large, numerous mitochondria that you can see make up about 25 to 35% of the cell's volume. And then we said also we're going to find there are going to be the myofibrils. And then we've got nuclei. So just to give you an idea of all the components you've got inside of there. Next thing here I want you to know, so also in relation to cardiac muscle, you have intercalated discs. You have intercalated discs. You can see them here very nicely. They're vertical in appearance here compared to the nuclei, which are a little bit more uh, spherical or even here uh, uh, not so spherical, but uh, not horizontal, a little bit more vertically placed, you could see. A little bit more stretched out kind of there as well, you could see. So you've got intercalated discs. These intercalated discs are going to be dark staining junctions. They are dark staining junctions where you see two cardiac muscle cells interlock or come together. Dark staining junctions where two cardiac cells interlock or come together. Now these discs, these intercalated discs, they're important because these discs are going to contain anchoring desmosomes, and gap junctions. You can appreciate those anchoring desmosomes here very nicely, helping to keep each of these cardiac muscle cells anchored right next to one another. And then here we have gap junctions. And we've got gap junctions. So the desmosomes, the desmosomes, they're going to prevent adjacent cells. They're going to prevent adjacent cells from separating during contraction. They prevent adjacent cells from separating during contraction. And the gap junctions, the gap junctions are going to allow ions to pass. They will allow ions to pass from cell to cell. And when ions pass from cell to cell, this is going to help to transmit current across the entire heart. So they also contain gap junctions that allow ions to pass from cell to cell, transmitting current across the entire heart. So basically you can say helping to electrically couple the adjacent cells. Electrically couple the adjacent cells. So the desmosomes they prevent adjacent cells from separating, while the gap junctions allow ions to pass from cell to cell, transmitting current across the entire heart. Now, what you know, because cardiac cells are electrically coupled by the gap junctions, okay, so we can see here, since these cardiac cells are electrically coupled by the gap junctions, the myocardium behaves as a single coordinated unit. The myocardium behaves as a single coordinated unit because cardiac cells are electrically coupled to one another via gap junctions. So we say it behaves as a single coordinated unit or a functional syncytium. So it behaves as a single coordinated unit or a functional syncytium. The rest of the inside of the cell is going to look similar to that of skeletal muscle, as I've described when I went through the different parts there. So when we look at those components, you can see each of those components here. I told you We've taken care of the gap junctions and desmosomes. We said nuclei, mitochondria, T 
T-tubules wider, right? Wider and less numerous. Sarcoplasmic reticulum simpler. And look at that there as well. You, we don't see any terminal cisternae or anything like that here. A bands, I bands, Z discs, right? The uh, sarcomere uh, basically had all those different parts there. That's exactly what we're seeing right inside of here as well. I told you the numerous amount of mitochondria. You can appreciate that there as well. That's just with one cell. Now, even though both heart and skeletal muscle are contractile tissues, okay, even though they are both contractile tissues, they have three differences I want you to take note of. They have three differences that I'd like you to take note of. Number one, number one, we'll see is going to be the means of stimulation. Number one is the means of stimulation. Skeletal muscle fibers have to be stimulated to contract. Skeletal muscle fibers have to be stimulated to contract by a nerve ending. We'll see the heart. The heart contains two kinds of myocytes. It contains two types of myocytes. Almost all of the myocytes, almost all of the myocytes are what we call contractile cardiac muscle cells. Which are going to be responsible for the heart's pumping activity, which are going to be responsible for the heart's pumping activity. However, certain locations in the heart, however, certain locations in the heart contain special non-contractile cells, which are called pacemaker cells. These pacemaker cells, such special cells, these pacemaker cells, they're special cells, and they're special because they spontaneously depolarize. They will spontaneously depolarize. We said a few minutes ago, the heart cells are electrically joined together by gap junctions. Now, these pacemaker cells, they can initiate not only their own depolarization, but also that of the rest of the heart. So, some cardiac muscle cells are self-excitable. We can call them self-excitable cells pacemaker cells. They're also known as neuromyocardial cells, aka neuromyocardial cells. So again, these cells, these cells can not only initiate their own depolarization, but that of the rest of the heart too. And in a rhythmic fashion, in a rhythmic way causing the heart to contract as a single coordinated unit, or we said a functional syncytium. And we call this property automaticity or autorhythmicity. We call this property automaticity or autorhythmicity. Second, 
Second, I'd like you to know the heart contracts as a unit. Skeletal muscle was a motor unit contraction. So here you have organ versus motor unit contraction. In skeletal muscle, impulses don't spread from cell to cell. Only, we saw, only the cell, only the muscle fibers stimulated will contract. In cardiac muscle, in cardiac muscle, either all fibers in the heart are going to contract as a unit, or the heart doesn't contract at all. This coordinated action, this coordinated action, it occurs because gap junctions electrically tie all cardiac muscle cells together, as we said, into a single contractile unit. The depolarization wave, it travels across the heart. It's going to travel across the heart from cell to cell via ion passage through gap junctions. It's pretty cool, pretty fascinating. Number three then. Number three is the length of the absolute refractory period. The length of the absolute Refractory period. Now, when we talk about the length of the absolute refractory period here, I want you to know tetanic contractions. Tetanic contractions cannot occur because of the length of this absolute refractory period here. So this is a period when the cell is inexcitable. This is a period when the cell is inexcitable. In skeletal muscle cells, this absolute refractory period, this period is short-lived. This period we saw when we looked at skeletal muscle, it was only 1 to 2 milliseconds. It lasted only 1 to 2 milliseconds. Now in cardiac muscle, in cardiac muscle, this period, it lasts over 200 milliseconds. It lasts over 200 milliseconds. Now, the long refractory period, it's going to prevent tetanic contractions. Basically, it's going to prevent that muscle from getting tired. That'd be horrible. That would stop the uh, heart's entire pumping action. So, tetanic contractions, I keep mentioning, they're sustained muscle contractions. You can have cramps to... Uh, you know, the spectrum varies from cramps all the way to uh, tetanus. So the long refractory period is going to prevent tetanic contractions, which would stop the heart's pumping action. So if we have these longer tetanic, uh, longer uh, refractory period, maybe in skeletal muscle, who knows, maybe... Uh, I mean, you know, we wouldn't have that there, but I uh, obviously contraction would be altered. It wouldn't be the same type of contraction we're getting. So these were some differences. These were some differences. Let's look at some similarities now. Let's look at some similarities now. When we look at some similarities, some similarities are going to include, number one, cardiac muscle Contraction is going to be triggered. Cardiac muscle contraction is going to be triggered by action potentials. It'll be triggered by action potentials that sweep across the cell's membrane. That sweep across the cell's membrane. About 1%. About 1% of the heart's cells are autorhythmic, we said, and they have the ability to depolarize spontaneously. And so they pace the heart. And so they are going to pace the heart. 
The majority, 99% of the heart muscle is composed of contractile muscle fibers. And they're responsible for the heart's pumping activity. In these contractile cells, in these contractile cells, you'll see the sequence leading to the contraction. The sequence leading to contraction are similar to that in skeletal muscle. So again, in contractile cells, the sequence, the sequences that are going to be leading to contraction are similar to that in skeletal muscle. How, you may ask? Well, first, depolarization opens up fast, voltage-gated sodium channels in the sarcolemma, just like we saw there. So depolarization opens fast, voltage-gated sodium channels in the sarcolemma. And you know what happens then? This allows the extracellular sodium to enter into the cell. Now, the sodium influx, this sodium influx is going to cause a reversal in the membrane. It will cause a reversal in that membrane potential and it will take that voltage from minus 90 millivolts up to plus 30 millivolts. And this period is very brief. This period is very brief. And we can see that right inside of here. So that's depolarization here. It's a little different of an action potential from what we saw before. Next, number two, transmission of the depolarization wave down the T-tubules ultimately causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into the sarcoplasm. So again, transmission of the depolarization wave down the T-tubules ultimately causes sarcoplasmic reticulum ultimately causes the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium into the sarcoplasm like you have seen before. Third, then, excitation contraction coupling occurs as calcium provides a signal. Right? We saw that before. So excitation contraction coupling occurs as calcium provides the signal via troponin binding, you remember that, for cross-bridge activation. So these three steps are common, like I described. These three steps are going to be common to both skeletal and cardiac muscle cells. To skeletal and cardiac muscle cells. However, however, I want you to know that they are going to differ. They will differ in how, in how the sarcoplasmic reticulum is stimulated to release calcium. So these three steps are common to both skeletal and cardiac muscle cells. They differ in how the sarcoplasmic reticulum is stimulated to release calcium. The extracellular space, the extracell extracellular space, it provides about 10 to 20 percent the extracellular space provides about 10 to 20 percent of the needed calcium for the calcium pulse that's going to trigger contraction 
We didn't see that happening there with skeletal muscle. So here, the extracellular space provides about 10 to 20 percent. It's an important component. It's going to provide about 10 to 20 percent of the needed calcium for the calcium pulse that triggers contraction. Now, once inside, once inside, it stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So once this calcium is inside, once inside, it stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release the other 80%. Calcium is barred. Calcium is barred from entering non-stimulated cardiac fibers. But when sodium-dependent membrane depolarization occurs, the voltage change also opens channels that allow calcium's entry from that extracellular space into the cell. So when action potentials pass down the T-tubules, it opens slow calcium channels, slower L-type calcium channels, which allow calcium in to trigger more calcium's release. So again, the extracellular space provides about 10 to 20% of the needed calcium for the calcium pulse that's going to trigger contraction. Now, once that calcium is inside, it stimulates a sarcoplasmic reticulum to release the other 80%. Calcium is barred from entering non-stimulated cardiac fibers. But when sodium-dependent membrane depolarization occurs, the voltage change also opens channels that allow calcium entry from that extracellular space into the cell. And these channels are called slow calcium channels, we said, or L-type channels. Called slow because their opening is delayed a bit. Because their opening is delayed a bit. The influx of calcium, we'll see the influx of calcium through these channels triggers the opening of nearby calcium-sensitive channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum's tubules. So the influx of calcium through these slow calcium channels triggers the opening of nearby calcium-sensitive channels in the sarcoplasmic reticulum tubules. This increase in calcium increases the intracellular calcium concentration. Now, sodium channels have inactivated and repolarization has begun. The calcium surge across the sarcolemma, the calcium surge across the sarcolemma, it prolongs. It prolongs that potential briefly. It prolongs that potential briefly, producing on this action potential what we call a plateau producing a plateau on our action potential. And we can appreciate that plateau here very nicely as number two. We didn't have repolarization happen right away and right after. It's being prolonged thanks to this plateau phase. And why is the plateau phase occurring? We said due to that calcium influx through those slow calcium channels. So what's that doing? It's keeping that membrane depolarized. Because only a few 
calcium, uh, only a few potassium channels are going to be open. That few potassium is not enough to combat the calcium. So you see, we have a plateau taking place. So at the same time, a few potassium channels are open. Next thing we have what we call repolarization. Repolarization results from inactivation of calcium channels and the opening of the voltage-gated potassium channels. So here you've got repolarization. Repolarization results from inactivation of calcium channels and opening of voltage-gated potassium channels, which allows the potassium to leave the cell. And when it leaves the cell, this is going to help to restore the resting membrane voltage of minus 90 millivolts. So repolarization, we've got right in there as well. Let's talk then energy requirements. So you've got that action potential down, okay? Different from what we saw before in skeletal muscle. So this is again the contractile cell, the contractile cell. We haven't seen the autorhythmic yet. I'll show you that uh, as we progress. And here in purple, you can see the actual tension being created for contraction. So when we talk energy requirements, cardiac muscle has more mitochondria than skeletal, as we saw. That shows its dependence on oxygen. That shows its dependence on oxygen for energy requirements. For energy requirements. So again, the amount of mitochondria shows its dependence on oxygen for its energy Metabolism for its energy requirements, whatever you want to say there. Cardiac muscle relies almost exclusively on aerobic metabolism. Great dependence on aerobic respiration. Because of that, it cannot operate efficiently for long without oxygen. Both muscles... Both muscles use multiple fuel molecules, as we have seen with skeletal muscle. Most, you saw, uh, they're going to use multiple fuel sources, including glucose and fatty acids. Cardiac muscle is much more adaptable. It's much more adaptable, and it uses whatever nutrients are going to be available. I mean, I have more power to it. You know, don't stop working on me. So cardiac muscle is much more adaptable and it uses whatever nutrients are available, including even lactic acid that gets generated from skeletal muscle. If the heart loses its blood supply, the lack of oxygen will be the danger, not the lack of nutrients, because again, it's ready to use anything as a nutrient. Plus, I'd like you to know, when a region of heart muscle is oxygen-deprived, like in a heart attack, the ischemic cells, the ischemic cells metabolize anaerobically. They're getting now no oxygen, so they start to metabolize anaerobically, producing lactic acid. Now, this increase in production of lactic acid, this increase in acid and calcium in the cell is going to damage the mitochondria and no ATP production is going to occur. This also closes the gap junctions. This also closes the gap junctions isolating then the damaged cells, 
leading to eventually arrhythmias, leading to arrhythmias, where the heart doesn't coordinate its beats. So here now when we talk the blood supply, we can see here we've got on the outside of the heart our major arteries and our major veins. So we've gone through and you've seen these in anatomy. You've got your coronaries, your right coronary and your left coronary. The right coronary comes out and it branches and it's going to give off a few branches and those branches are going to be responsible for supplying those respective areas. Here you can see the left makes its way out and it's going to divide and it'll divide into the circumflex and into the left anterior descending or you can say the anterior interventricular artery or the widow maker also known as right because this is the artery that's more uh, a higher chance of being occluded in a heart attack LAD Los Angeles Dodgers one way to remember that and then you can see the venous drainage. So here now, if this blood vessel gets obstructed, right, as we would see in a heart attack, so all of these ischemic cells here then are going to start anaerobically metabolizing energy, or trying at least. 